Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome today. Thank you for joining us uh, for our inaugural 360 Dialogue Series. My name is Leila Duraz and I will be your facilitator this morning. Today's session, entitled Disruptive Game Changers, will attempt to address how you need to reimagine your business models to retune yourselves to a new kind of norm. Businesses, irrespective of size, need to be flexible to confront the challenges and grab onto the opportunities that have developed in terms of market trends, consumer behavior, supply chains, and more. In this context, the 360 Dialogue series will offer you a platform to benefit from peer expertise, to gain insights into the new movements in business and what is currently affecting companies and industries from varying perspectives. Disruptive Game Changers will attempt to shed light on how the pandemic has been a turning point uh, for businesses in key sectors such as e-commerce, F&B and hospitality. Before I introduce you uh, to our welcome address this morning, I'd like to bring your attention to the interactive features we have today on our platform. Um, there are, there's an opportunity to ask questions to the speakers. Um, there will be a number of polling questions which will pop up on screen when the moderator introduces them. You are able to take notes and send notes to yourselves after at the end of the webinar. And finally, we have a messaging service which you can send public messages as well as messages directly um, uh, to specific delegates. This morning, we have over 200 delegates registered representing 26 countries. Again, welcome everybody uh, to our webinar. We truly hope you enjoy it. Um, I would now like to introduce Hassan El Heshemi. Vice President for International Relations, representing Dubai Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Thank you. Over to you, Hassan. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is a pleasure to welcome all of you to our inaugural 360 Dialogue webinar, which officially kicks off a brand new series launched by Dubai Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Through the series, we are establishing an ideal platform for knowledge sharing and insightful dialogue, offering uh, executive level insights across a wide range of industries. Just like many other major cities around the world, Dubai has gone through a major transition over the last six months with its economy and business landscape reshaped by COVID-19. Some economic sectors such as e-commerce, logistics, and health tech have thrived in recent months, driven by digital transformation, while others have faced challenges, uh, challenges due to restrictions. This is a pivotal time for Dubai as the Emirate is just beginning to restart its meetings and events industry after reopening its borders to tourists only a few months ago. Meanwhile, companies are reinventing their business models and fast-tracking digital strategies as they prepare for a post-COVID-19 recovery. Amidst all of these changes, Dubai Chamber is playing a crucial role in keeping the business community informed of the latest economic developments and market trends. And the 360 Dialogue series is a key initiative advancing these efforts. These monthly events focused on topics and issues of particular interest to businesses in Dubai will draw valuable expertise and insights from business leaders who are making their mark on their respective industries. The topic of our discussion today is certainly a timely one, given the growing momentum behind e-commerce and the entrepreneurship, which is being felt here in the United Arab Emirates and all over the world. Businesses are fast realizing that the future is digital. The recent drastic change in consumer behaviors has created a new reality, which requires companies to adapt quickly and think of, of um, online channels as a fundamental part of their business, as opposed to just an extension of it. The emergence of fourth industrial revolution has accelerated a global shift towards e-commerce to the point where buying products and services online has become the norm, a trend that is set to continue in a post-pandemic world. Businesses in the United Arab Emirates are well positioned to benefit from the e-commerce boom as they have several competitive advantages such as world-class logistics infrastructure, 
high internet penetration, and a tech-savvy population, which is increasingly turning to digital platforms to access products and services. Dubai Chamber has long supported local businesses in setting up and building their online presence. We've launched programs with our partners that have helped companies reach new customers, created interactive channels connecting trusted buyers and sellers, and guided startups throughout the process of launching their own websites. We've succeeded in our own smart transformation mission, and I'm happy to report that 98% of Dubai Chamber score services are now available online. To add to that, we continue to engage with our members through virtual events, uh, just like this one, and provide them with valuable support <clears throat> through the Business Connect uh, portal, which has helped companies deal with the impact of COVID-19. Through this experience, we have learned the importance of investing in innovative solutions and adapting to new market conditions. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you will find today's discussion to be interesting and insightful. And I take this opportunity to thank all, this, all these speakers that are joining us this morning. Thank you for your attention and your participation. Thank you very much, Hassan, um, for your kind words. I would now like to introduce Natalia Sichova, Entrepreneurship Head, Dubai Startup Hub for Dubai Chamber of Commerce and Industry, who will be moderating our panel discussion this morning. Thank you. Over to you, Natalia. Thank you very much, much Leila. Leila. And it's terrific today to have such a company of the founders uh, from Dubai. Well, as uh, Mr. Hassan mentioned, six uh, months uh, have been quite interesting and insightful for everybody. We at the Entrepreneurship Department of Dubai Chamber, we've noticed one interesting trend or dynamic when we just got this lockdown and pandemic unfolding in February and March, we've seen these two different types of entrepreneurs. We've seen those first timers, first-time entrepreneurs, um, they had their own dynamic. And then we had the serial entrepreneurs, like those who we have today uh, with us uh, during their panel. And the serial entrepreneurs, they dealt with the pandemic in a very different way. And uh, most of them started the new service, the new product, and some of them even managed to raise some capital during the pandemic as we speak. So, and that's why what we try to um, discover and go into the details what was what were the secrets of these founders and how they managed to pivot the business that allowed them not just to cope with the pandemic but to grow their business in the past six months and today with us uh, we have fantastic serial entrepreneurs uh, first i would like to welcome the ceo of instashop john soris john welcome thank you for um, Fantastic. Then we have Kevin uh, Chok, managing uh, partner and co-founder of Hotel Data Cloud. Kevin, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Last but not least, uh, the CEO and founder of Cloud Restaurants, Ziad Kamel. Ziad, welcome and thank you for being hey, with us today. Thank you for having us. Everything. So gentlemen, so if um, we can just to go with one, two sentence, what exactly you do? What's InstaShop, Hotel, cloud, uh, da um, hotel Data Cloud and Cloud Restaurants? So let's start with John with you, InstaShop. Great, thanks again for having me, a great honor. Uh, so InstaShop basically is, is an online marketplace that delivers uh, necessities, uh, essentials from supermarkets, pharmacies, uh, fruits and vegetable shops and so on, very fast uh, to your house within 60 minutes or under. That's basically the concept. Keep Dubai going. Sorry? Uh, keeping us uh, Dubai residents and uh, exactly. uh, citizens going, right? So yeah, especially in the Dubai. past six months. We're currently in, uh, in five countries across the Middle East and expand. We'll learn about this in a moment. Uh, Kevin, what about uh, Hotel Data Cloud? So Hotel Data Cloud is a content distribution platform for the travel industry. Um, this means we ensure that hotels can easily share descriptive information, um, pictures, images, um, lots of different facts about the property to any booking channel. Um, and while it's a B2B service, effectively, this means that consumers can find all the detailed information reliably on the channel of their choice, whether it's a travel agency, a booking website, et cetera. 
Thank you, Kevin. Uh, we have been following your journey for a very long time. I think uh, we, uh, as Dubai Chamber, have been uh, following you since you just uh, your just inception and when you got into the uh, Emirates Airlines uh, um, incubator. Exactly. Shortly after moving to Dubai. Indeed, indeed. Ziad, Cloud's Restaurant, what do you do? Cloud Restaurants is a digital first delivery only online restaurant company. So our purpose is to create meaningful online restaurants using the most noble ingredients, sustainable packaging and enjoyable customer experiences. So we're dedicated to innovating the online restaurant industry and operating at the highest standards possible. If you order food online, we want it to be from cloud restaurants. Our dream is to be the best online restaurant company in the world. So, and then uh, let's, uh, let's dive into how we're gonna achieve all these ambitions uh, and the vision of yourself and your founding teams. Gentlemen, so um, by now we have uh, invented even a vaccine from co for COVID-19. So right now I will invent uh, the time machine. And I will use this machine to move us together to February 2020. When you with your, uh, you yourself, your team members, uh, um, or just by yourself, you're sitting and you are observing what has been, what is unfolding in the market. So in February 2020, in your vision, what was the most probable and the worst scenario for your businesses? What you anticipated, what might have happened? if you didn't do what you actually did, and we'll discover that. What was the worst case scenario? So Ziad, would you like to start uh, sharing this? So yeah, going into your time machine, Natalia, our worst case scenario during the onset of COVID was having regulations mean that we could not operate. Basically means closing down the cloud kitchens and the delivery logistic infrastructure to deliver food. So that was absolutely the worst case scenario. Um, that didn't happen, thankfully. Food delivery was designated as an essential service and we took all the precautionary measures required to ensure uh, contactless food delivery at the highest food safety and hygiene standards. And we managed to thrive during the lockdown period. So if you can name one uh, biggest challenge that you faced, aside from the, this uncertainty uh, about re the regulatory uh, restrictions that would potentially be imposed on the sector. Uh, one of the biggest challenge was ensuring that our suppliers continue supplying us with the uh, food and beverage required to make our wonderful dishes. Another challenge was um, recruitment it was very difficult to recruit we were growing during the COVID period and it was very difficult to recruit new cooks and staff into our kitchens uh, because that whole recruitment industry or the whole recruitment process suffered as well and it was very hard to interview people and get them get new people into existing kitchens to trial as a cook uh, because to interview a cook is different to trying a cook uh, so that was a major challenge, how to grow our number of cooks in our kitchens during the lockdown period and how to ensure that our suppliers continue to deliver our products uh, during the whole global effect of, of supply chain and uh, delivery logistics. Thanks, Ziad. Thank you very much. So uh, my next question to Kevin and uh, for Kevin, the, uh, I was fascinated to learn that uh, by the time COVID started, you actually, um, uh, your clients have been operating in more than 150 countries and the total number of hotels uh, that used your solution was uh, around 11,400 hotels. That's a huge liability. So February 2020, what was the scenario? What was the most probable scenario? So February is interesting. Actually, February, the beginning of the month, I have family visiting and they were concerned about airport closing and I told them, come on, when would an airport close? That's, that's not going to happen. A couple of weeks later, COVID unfolded and travel came to virtually a standstill. And we saw even the most established legacy players um, see their revenues crumble um, down to almost zero. Um, and a lot of companies, with all the uncertainty that there was regarding the timeline, many companies said, um, 
we don't know if we will survive this. And these are companies where this question would have never been raised. Um, so the same happened on the hotel side. Um, operations were shut down, employees were furloughed. Um, and this happened throughout the world. There was not a single country where there was any exception. Um, and, and being a global player with hotels in every, every part of the world, um, we were kind of looking for that holy grail of, of a market that would recover more quickly. And uh, for several weeks, we didn't see this. Um, and yeah, so the worst case scenario in travel in the first months literally did happen. You just um, lived, then, lived through the worst case scenario. Exactly. Um, that's all we could do. That's all anyone could do. Um, you manage your costs, you, you reduce your burn rate, which is easier as a startup than, for example, as an airline. Um, they see very different challenges reducing burn. Um, and then see how the different scenarios play out. And luckily, um, we, we saw this um, particularly in Asia. The market there recovered a bit more quickly. People started traveling domestically, which we've now seen happen in Europe. Um, and, and here in the UAE, um, from all hotel partners in the Northern Emirates, we're hearing reports about occupancy rates that they've never experienced before. So they've actually had a very good summer uh, for the most part uh, with residents um, planning trips locally if they can travel abroad. But again, it's like this uh, unpredictability of the planning cycle for your own business and how you Absolutely. close the contracts as well. And Thank that you. agility Thank is what's needed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, John, so for you, I think you are one of those sectors that um, the blessing could quickly be turned into the curse for the business. When the demand for online deliveries spiked and your operations are very much linked to the capacity and preparedness of the agents and the shops that you operate across multiple markets. So February 2020, what was the worst case scenario for InstaShop? Great. It's, uh, uh, I think our worst case scenarios then uh, were, you know, dwarfed from the reality in a sense. Uh, I mean, the reality is, of course, the demand uh, spiked uh, to levels that, you know, to a certain extent we were not able to control. And, and that alone might sound, uh, you know, super attractive, but it's a truly uh, extremely challenging situation to handle. So, uh, if you combine an extreme spike of, you know, times three, times four uh, within a matter of a month uh, with operational limitations where you have shops uh, closing suddenly because there's a COVID case, right? If there's a COVID case in a, in a supermarket, you're going to have to, you know, temporarily close the shop. You have to take the whole uh, staff through tests. They have to be quarantined. <laughs> so all of a sudden you have a, a, a constraint, let's say, in the supply. Uh, and at the same time, you have a very high surge uh, in demand. If you combine that, uh, then it's a, it's a recipe uh, for hardship. Uh, so, of course, um, the reality is that InstaShop was the, basically the only platform across the, the months of the, of the extreme, let's say, part of the lockdown that was actually able to deliver same day slash next day groceries. And the way we did that is basically by not sleeping. <laughs> Uh, by working day and night on algorithms to become more efficient uh, to manage this extreme uh, increase in volume. So basically, uh, to put it very simply, we had to scale uh, in one year scaling we had to do in, in two, three weeks in order to survive and to continue providing the service. And all of you so survived? That's, that's and all of because you know not sleeping is, is a very bad scenario because i love sleeping so yeah <laughs> well um, that's uh, what that's what takes uh, entrepreneurship and that's why uh, not everybody of us is running such fantastic businesses like all of you do so um so right now what we will do and i would like to remind the audience that uh, we will be periodically having an interactive polls and right now we want to validate whether the audience on uh, in this event is actually sharing the same sentiment because majority of the participants on this call presumably are entrepreneurs business owners or the employees of the private sector companies and so the question that I will ask the team right now to um, put on our screens is about what type of challenge did your business face during the pandemic which challenge was the most acute so access to finance access to technology people management or supply chain like Ziad for instance uh, the critical aspect so the poll went live we have 30 seconds to answer but this will not stop us from um, 
firstly continue with our discussion and secondly i would like also to remind our audience to keep asking the question questions in the um, q a uh, section and then so we will um, answer those um, during our event so uh we discussed the worst case scenario uh, gentlemen pretty scary right uh, it's uh, now we can say um a little bit of breathing we're getting uh, somewhere in september so but i want to dive and uh figure out why you managed to overcome those uh, existential challenges for your businesses so and i would like to speak about the brand building relationship with partners supply chain providers in the time of pandemic and i'll probably start again with ziad since ziad you mentioned the supply chain right how do you ensure that what what, a, what was the dynamic between your business and supply chain partners uh, and how the brand that you built worked and helped you to overcome the challenges? Well, th thankfully, uh, our suppliers did not run out of product amongst them. Dubai was always plugged in and always ensured that the supply chain for food was always uh, respected and available. So if um, one of our suppliers may have run out of a specific product, it was readily available at the second or third. So we managed to maintain our product list in that way. And now when we wanted to innovate during uh, COVID, because we, we currently have uh, 10 delivery only brands, uh, two of them were born during COVID. One of them was born out of the necessity that people, some people didn't feel safe consuming or ordering ready-made food. They wanted to cook at home. And I think that was a global trend. You could see uh, people cooking sourdough and banana bread and all sorts of things and posts on social media. So people were really had the time to discover their culinary sides. Um, but some people didn't want to start from scratch. So what we did is we created a concept called Go Cook. Of course, we have ready-made like Go Greek and Go Healthy and Go Pasta, but we created Go Cook where we would help with the mise en place or the preparation. And uh, we, that concept was born in COVID. And uh, what we did was we sent customers or customers could order products that were prepped for them, like ready-made home, uh, homemade fresh sauce packaged in, in the most hygienic packaging, uh, fresh pasta, same thing, you know, they, and with instructions to, to make a bolognese or to make a carbonara. Um, we would send them our handmade frozen spring rolls for them to cook at home, dumplings and the sort of thing. So Go Cook was born out of, out of COVID. We managed to, to innovate um, and uh, we managed to keep our product list going. So the new brands that were created were created using our existing product list. Uh, that was, again, taking a step up was, was, was guaranteed by our supply chain and uh, a step higher than that by Dubai's leaders uh, ensuring that uh, food supply would never be in short for the country. Thank you, Ziad. Thank you very much. Uh, Kevin, uh, for you, the question about the, um, I think probably managing the relationship with your customers, because what you, uh, and also brand, because uh, from um, what we know during the pandemic, you actually managed to introduce a healing solution for tourism. <laughs> when people were even scared to think about to traveling or uh, being a tourist again, uh, you actually uh, approached your clients and said, I have actually a solution for you. So how you build that uh, relationship and how you manage the relationship with the hotels? So what was important for us is that we worked very, very closely with our clients and spoke to them, listened to them about what their concerns are, what their um, experience is managing this crisis. Um, and there were certain things where we simply couldn't do anything. Um, if a hotel had to close operations because it was so demand, there's not much we can do in this instance to help. But there's something we can do for the future. And this is what was recognized by the United Nations World Travel Organization as a healing solution for tourism, as you mentioned. That we said, um, once travel does resume, we need to kind of regain that trust of travelers and rebuild that confidence um, as an industry as a whole. 
And the only way to do this is be completely transparent about the restrictions that are perhaps still in place about the limitations on the properties, but most importantly about the different measures that were introduced to safeguard um, and make sure that guests have a healthy, um, safe experience when they do travel. Um, and this is something where hotels said, well, we're being bombarded with all this information from, from the government side, from institutions um, who are saying, these are all the different measures we need to do, but how can we get the word out? Um, we know that travelers maybe book on the hotel website eventually, but the whole discovery process happens on lots of different channels. And this information has to be readily available. Um, so we introduced, we, we slightly pivoted by introducing a new section in our platform that is dedicated to different COVID related information um, and can quickly be modified, can be locally customized depending on government regulations. And, so you're basic, and this was a very collaborative effort. Basically, right now, you are just, it's not about uh, the enhancing the uh, CTR uh, 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 click through rate uh, of the hotel, but rather ensuring that they have more close relationship with the customers and uh, provide the safety guidelines in a timely manner. Yes, which, which does lead to an increased CTR at the end of the day. So it's always going to be about that. It's go always going to be about booking conversions and, of course, about um, upselling. Um, but but that's um, the basis for that is that the guest is willing to travel and feels that it's safe to go to a certain property or destination. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Um, Jern, 75% uh, retention rate of your customers. <laughs> so to achieve that, uh, so brand uh, is it brand is it operations so uh what allowed you throughout the pandemic to maintain the 75 percent retention rate of your customers john you unmuted please yeah that's a great question that's uh that has a, a lot of aspects to answering it uh, obviously execution is extremely key uh, and uh, what we're looking over there is basically a very simple concept. So getting your groceries on time or at a reasonable time at your doorstep uh, with the appropriate accuracy. That's, that's the service. Uh, the reality is much more complex. I think retention rate uh, for, for Ainsish in particular, of course, has to do with the brand, but the brand is simply the result of, of our actions. So customer care has played a very critical role. Are we able to answer relatively fast uh, within minutes to, to an inquiry or a complaint or any, any, any relevant, let's say, uh, action or touch point that our users have. So we're, at, we're able to counteract that and, and respond quite swiftly. And, and overall, it has to do with uh, maybe corporate responsibility as well that we're building over time. So the loyalty, the, the intangible aspect be, besides execution, and how, 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 let's say, uh, a user actually uh, relates to our brand. So we've been quite active lately with corporate responsibility. We don't always provide the, the visibility or the PR around it, uh, but around the ones that we have provided PR, it's uh, our food program, our, our free grocery program to families in need uh, in Lebanon also. We've been quite supportive uh, of the situation over there. So all these things create a retention component and a loyalty of the users. Uh, towards our company, our service, and our brand. And I would assume uh, educating the uh, agents in your supply chain. There is a lot of education needs to happen. Huge. As I, as I said, Natalia, we're, we are a marketplace. So uh, a marketplace heavily relies, just like uh, restaurants, the same or anything, we rely heavily on the professionalism of, of our partners. Uh, so a lot of education has to go into it. Of course, COVID and the acceleration, let's say, of, of the digital transformation has, has made our job easier uh, because now we don't have to convince them uh, that uh, digital and online is the future. So that's, that's a big uh, plus. Thank you, John. So right now, I would like to draw our attention to the result of the poll that we just ran before. And according to if the team, uh, you could uh, pull uh, the results of the um, um, poll on the screen so all the participants uh, could see that. And uh, we see that uh, the main challenge that uh, the participants uh, of this session faced during the COVID-19 uh, uh, lockdown was uh, supply chain it's almost uh, 40%, it's 38% of people. Uh, the second um, uh, challenge is access to finance, uh, then uh, people, um, people management and access to technology. 
For me, what's fascinating that earlier in March, uh, we have been, as, as Dubai Chamber, we have been uh, running a number of uh, virtual events and these kind of di dialogues and discussions. And we've run a similar uh, questionnaire. And back at that time when things were just unfolding, the main um, challenge was uh, around um, access uh, to technology, access to finance and managing people. So, and that's what uh, today we could see that back that time when uh, things unfolded, uh, we overestimated uh, the role of technology and we underestimated the role of supply chain. As a business owners, as operators within the business community, we were under impression as the market in the resilience uh, of the supply chain that we have. And the pandemic gave us a lot of lessons uh, on how the actual things are. And technology is much more accessible, but it's the whole value chain within your supply chain that what uh, can break your business. And this is what we as the Vice Chamber, that's why for us uh, in the past six months, we have been exceptionally busy of introducing the, these new services and the new solutions, tackling the loopholes, uh, improving the aspects of supply chain to, to various verticals uh, within the industries. So interesting enough, but um, one challenge is recognized by one quarter, uh, by quarter of the participants is people management. And we can't avoid that because in the end, technology, technology can uh, go wrong, but uh, what's even more dangerous when the people don't support they don't support your vision or they deal with uh, their issues with their anxieties throughout these difficult times so and this is where my next question will be uh, i'll open and i would like you to talk about how you manage your employees whether you we like we've heard that Seattle was actually hiring and there was other challenges related to hiring but there might, might potentially some of you actually had to reduce the staff and again there is no white and black it's a business decision but how you manage that business decision that's what makes and adds to your brand and your sustainability in the market so let's pause and talk about the um employees the management of the employees and the management team um, dynamic because i know all of you have co-founders and maybe you can speak about that how COVID actually impacted uh, your um, management dynamic as well so maybe kevin maybe you could start first um that's actually a really interesting question for us because um as you know we've raised funding in the middle of the pandemic and that funding was used to hire new employees um, so, for example, our, our, our new VP of Global Sales joined us in March and never set foot into our office because we went into lockdown. Um, so we started working from home, even though we had consciously hired in Dubai. Um, we're, we're very used to working remotely, but the management team was very consciously hired in Dubai. Um, so with him onboarding, um, everything was remote, everything was virtual. And we managed this, though, with daily calls, starting each day with a, with a video call just really to make sure that there is that people relationship, that that is built up and, and that we communicate very openly about our, our fears, our anxiety, but also the opportunities that we do see. Um, and then as we, as we hired more team members, that very clear, transparent line of communication um, was kept upright. And I think that is key. Um, that's something that um, we've relied upon as co-founders. Gregor and I speak very openly about what's going on, about our concerns. And, and keeping that consistent line of communication with employees, that really helps and um, gets everyone on the same page um, as to where are we going, where are we headed, what, what can we do to accelerate, but also what, what kind of concerns do we need to kind of take into account and make sure that they're addressed. Um, and this goes beyond employees to our stakeholders as well. And, and that's of course where, where influence is not as direct um, some stakeholders spoke very openly with us, communicated when there's going to be certain pauses due to furloughs or to employees not being available. Others went dark, and that's where it gets really hard to work with them. If they go dark um, and don't communicate why, and don't communicate when that's expected to change, then, then it's tough for us to work with them and help them. Um, and we're here to help. That's the definition of our service and our solution. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much. Ziad, you have been hiring. You already mentioned a little bit of the challenges around hiring and um, uh, managing employees and new employees. Uh, what about the team, uh, the management team? Uh, who's on your board and how um, those hard decisions to make uh, were, were made during, uh, during the lockdown? 
Um, well, well, luckily, our chief brand officer is my partner. She's my wife. So we were locked down together. So at least um, we had uh, each other to discuss the business and to brainstorm. Um, in terms of our, our marketing team and our finance team, that was all had to be done remotely. Um, thank goodness the infrastructure um, uh, in, in Dubai uh, supported uh, video conferencing calls because that helped a lot. Um, another challenge as well was our operational management team. Um, they couldn't work from home because they operate kitchens, right? We had, they had to keep working. So there was always a risk. So we couldn't meet them face to face either. Um, and they were always out and about going from home to kitchen. Uh, and we had to ensure that the whole team remained committed to the mission. And, you know, there was some, at some point, the COVID took up so much mind share from everyone, so much media share, so much media attention that it became overwhelming and quite difficult to remain, to keep the team uh, on, on our mission to produce the best food possible, right? At the same time, we also had to ensure everyone's safety with public transportation uh, shut down. We had to quickly scramble and uh, guarantee or ensure uh, very safe private transportation methods for our operating team and our management team who, who take a look after our, our seven and growing kitchens. And we had to ensure that everyone in and out of work were safe because if there was one case from any one of our staffs in any one of our kitchens, the entire kitchen would have to be shut down. And that's literally multiple brands and thousands of orders potentially lost. So it was a challenge uh, keeping everyone on, on, on the mission. And plus, we were very flexible with our employees. Some of our staff were not comfortable. Some of our operating staff were not comfortable leaving their homes and working in the kitchen, right? With the whole country pushing the stay-at-home narrative. Um, some of our staff wanted to stay at home. So that was a challenge as well. So sometimes we found ourselves understaffed in our kitchen uh, just because we gave everyone the personal decision of whether they wanted to come to work uh, or stay at home. Um, so those were some of the ways we, we overcame uh, the, the, personal the personnel challenges and the staff challenges. Um, but overall, I think um, we, we succeeded because we did continue double digit growth month on month uh, from February until today. Excellent, Ziad. So basically it's about having the clear objectives and then still have flexibility. So they, like these help people to be at their best and efficiency and commitment to your business and support your vision. So thank you, Ziad. So um, John, we also actually got one question to you and uh, the question uh, was asked by Amr and uh, it was about how John, uh, how InstaShop actually manages uh, on-time delivery. Well, I think uh, we actually found out that John, uh, John doesn't sleep. So uh, he sacrificed his sleep to ensure the timely delivery. But um, maybe you can touch to that question and linked it uh, to the fact that during the lockdown you were not only worried about the operations that you kept working on the timely delivery and safety uh, of uh, the agents and people working with you but you also were fundraising so and it's a lot of undertaking to take care of so how you with your management team were taking care of these two main objectives okay so great so for, for me, uh, InstaShop was put in a very uh, difficult situation, let's put it that way, the pandemic, because uh, suddenly we had an even more urgent purpose. Uh, you know, online groceries before the pandemic was something, you know, nice to have, very convenient, it's, it's a great service, but suddenly it became a, a per, a urgent purpose and necessity. Uh, uh, we had messages from mothers saying, you know, my babies are hungry and <laughs> we really need those uh, baby creams and that food uh, and where's the order and I've been waiting for two, three hours. Uh, and and th this was quite a widespread uh, reality. So people were very, very you know concerned and they didn't want to go out and they were really counting on us to deliver. Now, uh, regarding, regarding how we managed, I, I think again, it really has to do with purpose and mission and just staying focused on what we have to do. Uh, 
Now, we didn't exactly fundraise. I, I wouldn't, uh, we, we, we were acquired, right? Uh, so, of course, uh, having, having the discussions uh, and the negotiations uh, in, in the middle of COVID is, is extremely, uh, you know, difficult and frustrating uh, in the sense that, you know, you, uh, negotiations are never easy, right? You, you spend a lot of time going through the legalities, the details, and so on and so forth. And at the same time, of course, you have to manage uh, scaling and keeping uh, the business uh, healthy. So I, my co-founder, Ioan, of course, uh, was critical in, in managing the workload, but the entire team also uh, took, took a piece of the workload. So it's not me, obviously, that's uh, succeeding. It's the entire uh, team. So I think, I think we just kept doing what we were doing, just much more intense. Thank you. Thank you, John. So, gentlemen, what will happen right now? I would like to um, remind the audience that we are coming closer to the Q&A section uh, of this event. So I would encourage you to ask all the questions that you have now in the chat box. And we will um, run right now a quick poll. Because uh, what we heard from all the founders today on the panel that during the COVID-19, all of you have introduced, you pivoted your business and you introduced either the new sub-brand or product, either the new solution or the new campaign that actually helped you to keep going and grow your business. So the question I will ask the team right now um, uh, our technical team to put to pose the question and um, and I will invite uh, the audience to answer will you consider or have you introduced a new service or product in 2020 we shall see whether the market is actually sharing the same sentiment and approach as our co-founders and we, we have about 30 seconds to answer this question have you introduced a new product or solution in your business or you're considering we still have four months to go until to year 2021 so and right now we're actually entering the section of q and a's so we um, start receiving the question in the chat box and also we have those uh, received earlier so and we'll start with those that we received earlier as well so without uh, further ado let us uh, let us start with uh, questions and answers so gentlemen um, during the past six months as never before you received an incredible volume of uh, consumer data and insight. I'm always fascinated personally about this subject uh, because I, as I was joking uh, with some of you uh, during our conversations earlier, so uh, Zian, uh, Ziat, John, you actually know which part of uh, the city, let's say, speak Dubai, um, who go junky, who go healthy, so you can predict where the infrastructure for sport facilities will be needed. You know where uh, potential more healthcare services will be required, and so on and so forth, and you can predict the cyclicality or when people are ordering food exactly, uh, when they are home and when they are not commuting in the traffic. It's a lot of interesting insights that can be derived from the data that you have acquired. And Kevin, you know how people are caring about their travels and where they go and why do they go? Why do they go to the some Emirate and not another one and internationally uh, as well? How maybe it's a company brand, uh, country brand that stands and support the tourist uh, sector as um, and, uh, industry. So. I would like to uh, ask you, in your opinion, what is the next frontier of business models and services in Dubai specifically? What are these new solutions that you think or anticipate we, we are likely to see, whether within your direct sector or uh, other sectors, but again, based on your observations of how your business uh, have been going in the past six months? The next frontier. Ziad, would you like to start with? Sure. Um, I think when it comes to food F and B, uh, before the pandemic or before COVID, delivery was an afterthought to many operators. It was just a cherry on top of their operations. They didn't give it much consideration. The focus was on building uh, bricks and mortar restaurants and on the dine-in customer. Um, and delivery was generally pigeonholed to uh, historically fast food kind of cuisine types like you know pizzas or burgers or sandwiches. Um, 
a lot of restaurants, they, they discounted what delivery could do and they didn't build their infrastructures. Now, during COVID, this changed. A lot of operators were left, let's say, with their pants down and they scrambled to put together uh, delivery offerings because delivery offerings are different than bricks and mortar, than dine-in. Not everything travels well uh, and uh, infrastructure and menus have to be built that are optimized for the delivery radius and for the customer. Um, so that trend has already fast-tracked in our industry. And I think the fastest growing segment in food and beverage is the delivery segment. Um, as that grows and as more and more uh, restaurants develop sister brands or mirror brands uh, or cloud brands, uh, in, within the same infrastructure of their existing brands, uh, the more options customers will have to order. And as the whole, I think I see, I see the future having more optimized delivering uh, uh, networks, more areas that are covered, because not all areas in the UAE have, have wonderful options for delivery. There aren't enough cloud kitchen infrastructure um, Dubai is, is leading in it out of all the cities in the UAE and, and possibly the world. So what, we'll, what we will see is logistics, uh, whether it's delivery logistics, aggregators, or cloud kitchens and cloud restaurants, we will see this continue to grow into all areas uh, within a country or a city. And uh, really, cloud restaurants and cloud kitchens are, are going to continue to innovate how they do business and operators are going to take notice or, or be left out. Brilliant, Yeah. So I will just, uh, let me uh, catch on what you're saying that, um, so you already hinted in the next big opportunity, what the objective of the um, cloud uh, restaurants in the next six, uh, 12 months? What is your objective? Uh, our goal is to continue growing our brand, continue, uh, we, we want our brands to be available in areas which they currently are. So this means growing existing brands into new areas, into new cloud kitchens as the infrastructure becomes available and also creating uh, new brands onto our portfolio for, uh, for also growth into our, let's say our distribution channel. So you, if you think about our cloud kitchen network now, of which we have seven and we're, we're adding, we're going to be 12 very soon. That's almost like our, our production facilities or fulfillment centers. In each of these, we have multiple brands going. So our goal is to continue providing and innovating with regards to the best delivery only brands and providing each radius with what we think the demographic of that radius and the customers who live in that radius, delivery radius, uh, want. So quite simply, our goal is to increase our coverage and increase our brands. Excellent, Ziad. So you're going deeper in the uh, along the supply chain, uh, even further in the supply chain and building those uh, nodes or that will support your business further. And not surprisingly, in the past um, uh, six months, we as Dubai Chamber, we, uh, we also facilitated and launched um, uh, the launch of the FMB uh, business group to support the businesses, introducing the new brands, and again, helping to, uh, to tackle the challenges uh, in the supply chain as well. So uh, Kevin, uh, question to you. Um, the next frontier of business opportunities and uh, what, uh, is, what keeps you awake? What are the big objectives and the goals for the next 12 months? So I'm, I'm certain we're going to see massive changes and shifts in the travel industry um, across the entire landscape of distribution of operators. Um, so travel, it's, it's an incredibly fast-paced industry on the operational side, but when it comes to innovation and long-term strategy, it's very reactive. Um, comparing travel to e -com, I would say we're 10 years behind when we look at the consumer experience. Um, people still book hotels the same way they booked it in 2010. Not much has changed. And, and consumers are actually very demanding and expect better. Um, and now with the idle time that the industry has had, a lot of companies have actually um, used that time to look at their tech stack, to look at their long-term strategy um, and find ways to improve that. So we'll be seeing a much more personalized consumer experience um, where Travelers are targeted uh, based on their interests, and that's something that, that they benefit from. 
um, a family traveling to Dubai will get very different um, hotel recommendations than, than somebody who's here for the cultural experience or someone who's here for the nightlife. Um, and we will definitely see an increase in travel. There's no doubt. Um, the doomsday scenario was always travel will never be the same. Um, yes, travel will change, but people will travel more consciously. Um, they will choose destinations more consciously and destinations and operators in those destinations will kind of have to play along with that and pick travelers up um, where their interests are. And, and for Dubai Expo 2020, which will be in 21, will still be an amazing opportunity to draw interest and draw a lot of people into the city. So you have definitely something to look forward to with your sector in Expo 20, 20 uh, happening. There are lots of growth opportunities, yes. Fantastic. And I'm sure you're already mentoring some of the startups in that area uh, and that could contribute to Expo 2020. We're expecting well. the next cohort of Intellect to um, commence within the next weeks and a lot of interesting new startups will come into town virtually initially and then in December in person. All the best, all the best with that. So, John, John. Uh, so, as I, as I mentioned, you have a lot of insights for consumers, and we we don't ask you to break all the insights out. But what is the next frontier of the new business models in Dubai? I I, I think uh, there there is a general trend of going dark. <laughs> so whether it's cloud kitchens, whether it's grocery, uh, dark stores and so on. So I do, I, I, I'm a believer, I'm, I push towards that direction of, a, of a integration and emerging of a brick and mortar and online marketplaces. Uh, so I see it going more and more there in the concept of micro fulfillment centers, which are basically small dark stores that deliver hyper locally. Um, but these, these are actually, uh, of this, out for in the case of InstaShop, these are created from our partner shops. Uh, that that's that's the idea, and we already see a lot of players in the market, uh, retailers, brick and mortar retailers, creating their uh, dark stores, which is great uh, news. But I also see uh, one level for, forward in the frontier: Internet of Things. You're going to be able your refrigerator will know your patterns of what you eat, what you do. They're going to be the refrigerator itself will be ordering for you. Uh, we're going to be using Alexa or these kind of voice enabled devices uh, more often to get various services, whether it's food deliveries, whether it's uh, groceries uh, and so on. Maybe drones uh, one day will come into play. Uh, uh, I mean, there's a lot of legislation, a lot of technology to actually make that happen. We might be delivering with a Hyperloop from Dubai to Abu Dhabi, <laughs> uh, various, let's say, uh, goods. Um, there, there's there's a there's a lot of dy uh, dynamics and a lot of technologies that will break frontiers and will make the current models obsolete. Uh, augmented reality uh, and VR generally is something that's uh, slowly maturing. So we don't really know. What we know is that we just have to constantly innovate. Otherwise, we're just going to get disrupted. That's the idea. Uh, then uh, let me just build on that. So do you um, anticipate more acquisitions and consolidation in your specific sector? Because uh, is it the dynamic that we are likely to see when the big conglomerate or the big group will be acquiring uh, the startups in your field? So what's your feeling about the next uh, uh, couple of years? I mean, it's a feeling, it's a personal opinion, definitely. I, I would say, I would say that... Uh, Probably, yeah, the, the direction of consolidation would be very attractive for large companies that, you know, lack the skill set, lack the know-how. Uh, so probably a consolidation would be a direction for bigger companies, conglomerates, as you said, Natalia, to accelerate their entry into markets and their market share gains. So my opinion would be, yes, we would see it. It's very interesting observation because what uh, we have been as Dubai Chamber, we have been running the program called Market Access, where we connect corporate organization with the startups. And when, in 2020, we were actually a little bit concerned whether the, we would actually see the interest, whether the corporates would have the, uh, the budget to engage with the startups. And what we've seen, the corporates within one sector, they would be actively looking to engage to acquire the startups in completely different sector and segment. So it's interesting how the current dynamic actually creates new opportunities for both players, for the smaller players, more dynamic, more technology savvy, more forward thinking with the big conglomerates who have bigger assets and uh, uh, high liquidity. So on this side, uh, so after the acquisition, John, uh, in the next six, 12 months, what's your and uh, Ioana objectives? 
I mean, the, 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 obviously, uh, as, as I said many times, number one for us, uh, for the acquisition is the healthy uh, cultural and, and the value fit that we have with Delivery Hero. Uh, another aspect, of course, is, is the ability to leverage uh, the footprint of the group uh, for international scaling. So, so definitely, uh, we will be actively looking and exploring together with Delivery Hero how we could further, you know, enhance uh, uh, the InstaShop uh, presence in other markets. And uh, yeah, I think that's the number one uh, benefit, learning from each other and, and growing much faster, accelerating. Another frontier of collaboration uh, uh, opportunities, upside and uh, the challenges uh, that are part of our lives. What's interesting, I would yeah. like right now to ask uh, the team to put the result of the poll that we ran earlier. So according to the poll, um, up to 50% of the um, participants have introduced or are considering introducing of the new service and uh, or um, product in the market in 2020, which is interesting. It's slightly less than uh, our sample group of three entrepreneurs and founders. So I think that's why uh, the benefit of this session that we have today is actually we look at the different um, different angles uh, of the um, food and beverage and hospitality industry and e-commerce and so how within unprecedented pressures uh, created by the COVID-19 and the lockdown, uh, the innovators, the founders could, were able to come with uh, add value solutions. And so this is where I think that's the main, uh, my message uh, um, would be to the audience and the, to the entrepreneurs on this call is to look innovatively. Don't be afraid of introducing the new product and services. And I don't know if gentlemen, you agree with me. We do. Yeah, I do. Like based, on, based on the notes, I agree. So we have a couple of questions and uh, we will take more four minutes of your time to cover those questions that were coming uh, lately. So uh, one of the questions which, um, which we touched slightly, um, uh, the question asked by um, Damiola, Damilola. So the question is about, do you think the search of the new technologies uh, to enhance your business growth uh, actually led to the uh, to the um, staff downsizing or created um, avenues to increase your staff strengths. So um, I would actually even uh, uh, slightly um, amend this question. I would ask like, what's the effect of the new technologies? Uh, that do you, do, you, do you anticipate a reduction of your staff due to the technologies or on the opposite, it's an upscale of your existing staff? Gentlemen, whoever want to, uh, like I will ask so one person for the, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So for us, it's a very interesting question because the travel industry traditionally, it's very human centered. Um, you need that uh, human factor to provide that personal experience uh, that the guests are looking for. And I believe that won't ever change. Um, there's always going to be human interaction um, with perhaps greater efficiency, but that will simply allow those people working in the industry to concentrate on other things that matter um, to travelers. Um, so for example, if we, if we increase the efficiency of the check-in process at the, at the hotel, um, then the check-in employee has time to ask maybe about the interests and, and how, to, how to make a better experience, how to increase the quality of the stay. Um, so the efficiency um, introduced by technology will be positive for the employees in our sector. Mm, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. So uh, one more question uh, that uh, we um, uh, that we got uh, uh, lately before I asked before, it's about scaling uh, from Dubai, right? Because you gentlemen, if I'm correct, uh, John, you started in 2015, Kevin 2016, and Zia 2017. So this is, a, this is a scale of three, five year old companies and all of you have somehow expanded and scaled across other markets. So um, how is it uh, to scale from Dubai? Uh, John or Ziad, who would like to pick up those questions? I could start with a very brief. I mean, the region for sure is, uh, UAE is, you know, the paradise of the Middle East, but the region is, is generally challenging. Uh, so, but it, uh, even in UAE, you know, there's certain struggles, for example, you need a license to operate in Abu Dhabi, a different license, different processes and so on. Uh, but if you look at Egypt, uh, it's it's a very challenging market as well. Saudi Arabia, again, a lot of licensing and stuff. Um, Lebanon, of course, now we're going through uh, many adversities. 
So generally, the region is challenging. We won't hide it. There's a lot of Europe and other regions are, are easier, uh, you know, to expand and to operate. Uh, laws are more uniform and so on. Uh, but it still remains an extremely attractive uh, area of the world uh, that's growing very strong in youthful populations. We know all the dynamics, uh, uh, sizable disposable incomes uh, across various markets. So it's worth the hassle, but it would be very nice if there was less uh, uh, barriers, let's say, to, to growth and to expansion. I think that's my in input. Thank you, John. So this is the dynamic we've seen. Uh, so uh, like based on our uh, statistics, right, we have about uh, six, th uh, 7,000 uh, entrepreneur startups registered with Dubai Chamber, aside from 144,000 members. And we've seen how some of our um, um, entrepreneurs, uh, they use Dubai, uh, Dubai as a platform, but then in the end, they grow their businesses in those um, MENA region and even beyond. And as Dubai Chamber, we obviously have the international offices uh, to support that, uh, that international expansion. But absolutely correct, every market has its challenges and every market, even within one country, sometimes you are almost entering the terra incognita where you have to be careful and cautious. And my last question of today uh, will be to Ziad, and it's uh, slightly linked to um, what John was saying about the operating in Dubai in the UAE. And the question is as following, uh, what the government and the regulators do really to unleash the power of entrepreneurship in Dubai? And please be frank as, as much as possible. Um, that's a fantastic question. I think John touched upon it. Uh, there are challenges, regulatory challenges uh, with, let's say, trade licenses, right? Even within Dubai, if you're an, a free zone company, then there are certain restrictions from working onshore. You can't use your trade license to work in other Emirates. You need to set it all up. There are different rules and regulations. Some of them are contradictory. So it's difficult to scale even within this country. Uh, another thing that um, I would mention is um, there are, um, it's expensive doing a startup here, right? If you're cash strapped, uh, setting up a license generally or a company generally requires a lease for an office. Office leases, as we all know, aren't cheap. The number of visas allocated to, to your company requires or is based on specific square footage area of your office space. So the only way to grow is to keep growing your office. And I think during COVID, it has been proven, the work at home model is now proven. So do we really need all this office space? I mean, I speak for myself. We have to rent an office just to get our trade license, but we don't need an office. We work in kitchens, right? But we're paying the lease for an office anyway. Do we ever step there? No, I have a work from home set up and uh, we have seven kitchens around town where we do most of our work. So these are some of the challenges faced. It is costly. It's not easy to understand all the regulations. Um, it's not easy to, to, to scale in a regulatory environment with regards to, to visas and who can do what in which district and zone. Um, so yes, if, those, uh, if, that, if this whole regulatory environment for entrepreneurs is consolidated on a federal level and clarified, I think it would make an entrepreneur's life uh, much easier and it would also incentivize small companies or growing companies even even our companies to to to, to scale quicker and uh, and benefit more thank you Ziad. thank you very much and this is what we as dubai chamber have um advocating for specifically in the past three four years when uh, we deeply in uh, get deeply involved with entrepreneurship ecosystem and understand those challenges that entrepreneurs are facing and um I, I would like to 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 conclude uh, the Q and A session and uh, all the insights uh, that we received from all of you gentlemen with uh, the quote from one of my favorite movies and some of you probably watched it, The Chariots of Fire. Uh, it's an old movie in terms of millennials, right? Uh, um, but uh, the famous quote by uh, our coach uh, Musabini was, uh, "You can bully the gods, but you can hone the nerves." And what three of you have demonstrated in this uh, challenge in 2020, you hone the nerves. And uh, this is why you are where you are with the new solutions and facing the challenges that either pandemic or uh, regulatory uh, framework uh, could bring and you have to face with a dignity, with ambition and with the right instruments supported by your team.
And thank you very much. And uh, I would pass uh, the mic back to Leila. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Natalia. That was absolutely fantastic. And to our speakers, an amazing job and very, very informative. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for joining us this morning. Uh, we really hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have enjoyed hosting it for you. Um, we would love to hear your feedback and we'll be sending you a short survey um, uh, very shortly after this uh, session. Um, and also hopefully we'll be sending you through a link to the video of today's proceedings as well for your records and to pass on to your colleagues and peers. Um, for those of you who took notes today, please don't forget to um, download them before you exit um, so you don't lose out on those notes. Again, I would like to um, thank all of our speakers, Kevin, Ziad and John for joining us this morning. Um, and thanks again to all of our guests who joined us at the webinar and we hope uh, to see you at our next edition. Thank you very much, everybody. Good morning. <laughs>